In previous lessons, we studied the following New Testament identifying marks of the Church of Christ. I always, in using that term, will say as it is defined and used by the inspired writers of the New Testament. We learned that it was founded by the scriptural builder, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that it was founded on the scriptural foundation, Jesus Christ. It was founded at the scriptural place, the city of Jerusalem. We learned, too, that Christ is the founder of only one church, which is his church, and it's revealed on the pages of your New Testament. We see, too, that it has a scriptural name. Now, I might say concerning the scriptural name that there are several terms of designation identifying the Savior with the realm of the saved and vice versa. But there is no proper name for the church. There are a number of designations of members of the Lord's church, but there is a proper name for each member of the church, and that is the word Christian as it is defined and used in the New Testament. It means of Christ. Everyone who is saved by Christ, by believing in Him, repenting of their sins, confessing their faith in Him, and being baptized for the remission of sins is added to the church by Christ Himself, Acts 2 and verse 47. The point being in this whole series of studies that if we know anything about the church, then go to the inspired primary source, and that is the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular. Now, in this installment of our study of the church, again, that church revealed on the pages of the New Testament, we will notice another identifying mark of the church of Christ. That is the scriptural organization of the Lord's church. The denominations are ruled by their ecclesiastical forms of government. They have ignored, for whatever reason, the head of the church, who is Jesus Christ, and have assumed the authority to govern <coughs> denominational churches as it pleases those who make up and founded those churches. In effect, with their mouths, most of them say that Christ has all authority, as he himself said, Matthew 28, 18. But, but their hearts are far from submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ as it's revealed in the words of His last will and testament, the New Testament of our Bible. Concerning the form of government of the Lord's church. Again, the only place you can find out about that as an identifying mark of the Lord's church is to go to the New Testament of Christ. Doesn't it make sense, as it has in all of this series of studies, and will as we continue on with it, the Lord willing through the next weeks, that if you're going to learn about the church of Christ, that you would go to the New Testament of Christ? Strange to me that people will not want to use the term that the Holy Spirit used in Romans 16, 16, to identify the realm of those Christ saved. And they don't like to say Church of Christ. If they do, they use it in a denominational sense as one among many that are acceptable to God. They do not have the concept of the church that is taught in the New Testament. So when it comes to governments among the denominations, we hear of synods, presbyteries, councils, general assemblies, various conferences. All of these are governing the various and sundry denominations. We should remember that there was 1,500 years that passed by from the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ in Jerusalem where the Lord started His church, where the church began, recorded in Acts 2, until the first Protestant denomination showed up. Yet the concept people have of the church today is a denominational concept that there's one invisible body of Christ made up of all of these different denominations with different names and governments and ways of being saved. That's not what you read in your New Testament. The problem is people don't read the Bible much anyway. And if they do, they do not know how to abide by 2 Timothy 2, verse 15 in studying it. 
that is, what it means to rightly divide or handle aright the word of truth as they study it. But such is necessary. You can't just study it any way you want to. You have to learn how to rightly divide the word of truth. And if there's just any way you want to type of attitude in, in studying it, then why does the Holy Spirit say through Paul to Timothy there's a right way to divide it? But there is. If there's a right way, there's at least one wrong way. In such assemblies of men and women as denominations, their members then, who among their members that are designated so to do, legislate laws to govern all of them. But the New Testament of Christ knows nothing of such power given to any body, man, man or woman, except to the apostles of Jesus Christ, the early church, before there was any word of the New Testament written. Luke, by inspiration, records as he writes part of the New Testament after the establishment of the church, that the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now, we have the apostles' doctrine today. It's the New Testament of Christ. We have the Lord's will because God the Father gave all authority to Christ. Christ, through the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, via the baptismal measure of spirit that came upon the apostles, has delivered unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness in the Scripture. So Peter, an apostle, said, Mere humans don't have the authority to change the law concerning salvation, worship, Christian conduct, whether moral or spiritual, such as homosexuality. It doesn't make any difference what the government says is right about that it is not right it is sin and it ought to be treated accordingly those people need the gospel as much as anybody else caught up in sin and we read first corinthians as paul writes to them he says some of the members of the church at corinth had been engaged in such immoral acts but he says they were washed they were cleansed well how is that so because the gospel is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. They had believed that gospel and obeyed it, and thus had been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Galatians 2.27 and Acts 2.38. Their sins were washed away. There's power in the blood, but you must be able to contact the blood. And that's in the waters of baptism. As you're baptized into the death of Christ, Romans 6.3 and 4, because it's in his death that he shed his blood for the remission of sins. He shed his blood to purchase the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. Any who would uh, tamper with the New Testament of Christ on anything, and since we're studying the government of the church, is in rebellion against Jesus. They are therefore guilty of sin. And remember, sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. Now, when Jesus promised to build his church, he told Peter, who had confessed that he was a son of God, that he would give unto him the keys of the kingdom. He used kingdom and church interchangeably to refer to the same institution, the realm of the saved. And as you read through the New Testament letters, you'll see that they're used interchangeably. The kingdom describes one aspect of the realm of the saved, and the church describes another aspect as does body of Christ, and so on. But we need to know that the Lord's church then, being that it's the Lord's kingdom, His citizens are in it, and we learned how a moment ago by obedience to the gospel. The Lord's church is a monarchy. Now, we've never lived under an absolute monarch. This nation was came into existence because people rebelled against George III, and they didn't want to abide in that way. So they formed a government. And they began a revolution. So we in America don't like the idea of monarchs. But that doesn't change on the basis of what we like as to the teaching of the Bible. That is, that doesn't change it on the basis of our likes and dislikes. The church of our Lord is the kingdom of the Lord. And as there is one Savior... He is that one monarch. He has absolute authority. You see Paul declaring that to the Colossians in Colossians 1 and verse 18. And he says the same 
in Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. You'll remember that when Peter thought he was doing a good thing there on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, by saying, let's build here three tabernacles, because the three that were there transfigured were uh, Abraham and uh, Mo or Elijah, Moses, and, and Christ. And he said, let's build three tabernacles. But then God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And that is perfect harmony with the Lord himself saying, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. And Colossians 3.17, it's written above my head here, that whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. So, Jesus then said that, and thus he has all authority. Now, notice that it's the Father, the first person of the Godhead, that gave all authority to Christ. In other words, his authority is delegated to him by the Father. But then notice as I said earlier, how we got the last will and testament of Christ. The Father delegated all authority to the Christ. And when you study the book of 1 Corinthians, you study 1 Corinthians 15 and so forth, you will see that he will hold all authority until the end of time when he destroys death. Then he'll deliver up the kingdom to God. He'll put down all rule and all authority. There are some people who believe that the kingdom has not been established yet, but it will be in our future. And they say it's different from the church. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. We'll talk more about that in later studies. But what we see is, is that the kingdom was in existence in the days of the apostles when the New Testament was written. Thus again showing how the kingdom, the word, is synonymous with church. It just simply describes different aspects of the same thing. So it's God the Father delegating all authority to the Son, and then through the third person of Godhead, the Holy Spirit, the apostles of Jesus Christ, the ambassadors of the court of heaven, and those they laid hands on who had the gift of prophecy, wrote the New Testament. That's how we got the New Testament. That's how God saw fit to do it. So Jesus had promised to send the apostles the Holy Spirit, and for what reason? to teach them all things and bring all that Jesus had taught them to their remembrance. That's part of what he's teaching about in John 14, 26 and John 16, verse 13. They were mere mortals as we are. How could they remember everything the Lord taught them? And how could he guide them into all truth except that they had supernatural guidance from God himself via the Holy Spirit? Thus, the only authority the church recognizes and to which it submits is the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth as he delegated it by the Holy Spirit to mankind through his apostles. Now the next point I want to emphasize is the autonomy, the autonomy of the Lord's church. Remember our general study is the government of the church as it's revealed as identifying marks so you can find the church. And we're studying that from the New Testament. In speaking of the autonomy of the church, then, what do we mean? Well, we mean the autonomy of the local church, or we say many times congregation. Now, in the New Testament, congregation and church are used interchangeably. You could just as well say in Romans 16, 16, congregations of Christ salute you as well as churches of Christ salute you. But many times in America, it's become a habit to us to say congregation when referring to a congregation like this one. Now, we've mentioned this many times before, but let's keep in mind, when the Lord organized the one church that he promised to build, Matthew 16, 18, and did build in Acts chapter 2, that's where the account is that it started, we find that he organized it not on a worldwide basis of the one worldwide body of Christ, but on a congregational basis. The church in Rome, the church in Corinth, the church in Jerusalem, the church in Antioch. Now let me say again, there's no larger or smaller organized entity of the one church that Christ built and shed his blood to purchase except on the local level, a church in any geographic location. 
Some of the commands that are given to the church could not be carried out if it's only organized on a worldwide basis. How would we all assemble like we're commanded to assemble on the first day of the week if that pertains to the whole universal church of Christ? Well, you couldn't do it. It would be an impossibility. So we know that assembly has to do with the largest and smallest organized entity of the church. And what is it? A congregation. And they're autonomous of, from all other congregations. They run their own affairs. As the New Testament teaches, we'll note this a little bit more later. Now, the autonomy is defined as right of self-government, a self-governing state, an independent body. And the apostolic church, many times we say the church you read of the New Testament, of the first century A.D., each church or congregation is autonomous. It is self-governing. Each was independent of one another. No local congregation had control or authority over another. It's just not there. That doesn't mean they all could have different plans of salvation. It doesn't mean there were many different gospels. It's quite obvious if you read Galatians chapter 1 that Paul makes clear that there's but one gospel and any tampering with it will get the anathema of God placed upon you. Each New Testament congregation was free and independent under the authority of Christ, the teaching of Christ and the apostles to govern itself, to carry on its own work as authorized by the New Testament and manage its own affairs when you understand what those affairs are of the Lord's church. All congregations had the same head. They all had the same foundation. They all worshiped scripturally the same way. They all had the same mission. Each preached the same gospel, and they constituted the one body of Christ. But... Each was independent to direct its own work in carrying out only what the New Testament authorized the church to do. And the obligations laid upon the church are the same obligations in every congregation. Now, we need to notice this in a very simple way. It's been used for years, not originally with me. The marvelous wisdom that God has and the arrangement of the government of the church and the autonomy of each congregation. If one church becomes corrupted in doctrine or influenced by evil practices, other churches, other churches would be corrupted, necessarily corrupted. Let me parallel that with the illustrations I said has been used many times. If a window is made up of one large pane of glass, a break destroys the entire pane. That whole window's gone. Well, let's look at this for a moment. When you look at a window made up of many different panes of glass, if one of them is broken, all of them aren't gone. And that's the way it is with the autonomy of the church and the independence of each congregation. And remember, there's no larger or smaller organized entity than the church in any given location. But as is the case with many matters pertaining to New Testament Christianity, if not all of them, the simple but wise organization has failed to satisfy people. Now let me pause here and emphasize this. The greatest enemy any one of us or all of us has is that we like things done our way. That will always be the case. Everything you find taught by Christ in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, his early, earthly ministry, came right back to this. Are you going to submit your will to mine? I call you me Lord, Lord, and what? Do not the things which I say. I suggest to you that beyond this actual teaching of false doctrine, which is by the will of man that men won't accept the truth but run after something else, contrary to the truth, that most problems in the Lord's church have been because men wanted to have their own way. Now, all I can say is think of your own life, think of your own family, think of jobs, think of the school, think of the government, Think of religion, and you'll see that that's how it works. 
Our greatest enemy is ourselves. Will we be honest with ourselves as we study the Bible? Will we objectively and honestly apply the truth of the Bible to ourselves? Or will we, when we find the Bible says something that we ought to be doing that we're not, we try to justify ourselves in not doing it? So there's a grave danger in anything we're talking about when it comes to service, the idea of service, you see, is submitting to the Master. When it comes to the church, it's always going to have to do with my will or your will. And thus, as Jesus struggled in the garden to do what only He could do to save us from our sins in purchasing the church with His own blood, in giving His body a sacrifice, in the garden, He said, Not my will but thine be done. And that ought to be the challenge to every one of us to always be able to say that. And again, that brings up Colossians 3.17. There's no way to submit your will to the will of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Master, and Savior, unless you comply with that which He's authorized. But these churches that are founded on the commandments and doctrines of men or any religion, it doesn't just have to be something that, a religion that believes in God and the Bible and Christ, but any religion that is not taught by the Bible in general in the New Testament in particular is simply something men conjured up and they've decided to go on and do their own thing. So they made denominations, worldly religions, and continue to make changes whereby their unchristian desires, in this case concerning the organization of the church, for ecclesiastical lordship could be accomplished. And that is very important to understand. History records that the first great departure from the truth, as far as the church is concerned, came in the system of church government. You read in your New Testament, you take the totality of the information given concerning the government of the church, elders in particular, who have different terms to refer to them that describes their various work as shepherds of the flock. And you'll find that there are multiplicity of elders over each congregation as we described a congregation in each geographic location. Yet, not long after the New Testament was fully revealed and recorded by 150 A.D., in the eldership, they had decided that one man would have more authority than the others, and later he would be called a bishop and the others would be elders. And thus, the long road of apostasy that eventually, out of that apostate church, Roman Catholicism developed with its whole hierarchy. And the denominations that formed as a protest to the corruption of Roman Catholicism, and you read of that in the Reformation, 14, 15, 1600, in Europe, adopted their own ecclesiastical structures for the government of the church. Now, let's look closer at what I've already introduced. As we examine the denominational churches, and we see truly little to nothing resembling scriptural church government, the Bible clearly states that the church is to be governed, as I said earlier, by a plurality of elders over each local church. They have deacons. The word deacon coming from the Greek word diakonos, which means to hasten to get the work done so fast you're kicking up the dust behind you. And they're basically, I like to think of, as the elders' lieutenants. They're servants. That's what the idea of deacon is. They are to meet certain qualifications, and they're to be appointed to do the work of deacons. The work of deacons is not the work of the elders, and vice versa. The Bible teaches very plainly that elders are to be appointed or ordained in every church, that is, in every geographic location where a church is found. Paul told Titus this. He's a young preacher. He was to believe it. He was to teach it to all the churches, Titus 1 and verse 5. These men are also spoken of, as I said earlier, as bishops, overseers, shepherds, and pastors. It's the duty of the elders, and that's very important to understand. This is what the New Testament teaches. Duty of the elders to take heed unto themselves. You'll notice when Paul wrote to Timothy, talking about his work as an evangelist, he started off by saying, as a preacher, you first take heed unto yourself. Well, if you become a Christian, 
There's no way to become a Christian except that you have to first take heed to yourself. When the gospel's preached, you've got to be able to personally apply it. You've got to be able to honestly evaluate your life. Are you in need of obeying the gospel, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And any time you read your Bible or in the Bible class or your sermons, that's what you do all the time. You make sure it is the Word of God, and then you make sure in your own personal life you're applying it. So elders were to take heed unto themselves. They have to know the work God has laid upon their shoulders. They have a work to do in the church that nobody else has to do. They have to understand what the church is. They have to understand how it's organized. They have to understand the work of the church and the worship of the church. They have to know the truth so they can recognize what is error and what is not the truth. And they're to feed the church, according to Paul, as Luke records in Acts 20 and verse 28, as he had called the elders of the church at Ephesus to Miletus to give them instruction. I say again, Acts 20 and verse 28. That's their job. It's a special job. It doesn't mean that other members of the church in their care one for another as brothers and sisters in Christ aren't to be mindful of each other and how we're living. But it means they have that special obligation to shepherd and all that that means spiritually the Lord's church. They're taught in Acts 20 and verse 35 to help the weak. Now that means weak spiritually. So that means people could be in the church and fully Christians, but they're weak. Well, Romans 14 in the book of Romans there you'll find that he addressed the church at Rome about weak brethren. Some people think, I guess they always ought to remain weak. That's never found in the Bible. People that are weak ought to want to develop and grow. So each member of the church is at different degrees of growth and develop and knowledge and practice of the truth. But nobody has ever been taught from the New Testament that if you're a weak person, that's just where you're always going to be because of the admonition for us all to grow in knowledge and practice of the truth. We are too, and elders especially, as shepherds of the flock, as pastors, as overseers. We're to exhort in sound doctrine. That means wholesome teaching. And we're to convict those who are not sound in doctrine. Paul again wrote that young evangelist Timothy saying, here's what you need to know and you need to teach at the church. Titus 1 and verse 9. Elders are charged with encouraging the faint-hearted and, and to be long-suffering. 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Let me say a little bit about the long-suffering. It means to suffer along with people. But I'm afraid some of us in our minds have thought that as we suffer along, we'll just tolerate any sin in their lives indefinitely. I never find that in the New Testament, and you can't either. Suffering along with people does not mean that you corrupt the practice of the truth while you allow them to live in sin. You can't find that in your Bible. Long-suffering is that you continue to live right, contend for the faith, Preach the truth. Apply it to different brethren. Deal with the weak brethren so you can make them stronger. But if you'll look into your New Testament and look at how the apostles and others did in the church as they dealt with one another, you'll see that it never involves corrupting the truth. It never involves tolerating uh, corruption in truth. So to suffer along with people means you just keep living right before them. You keep teaching the truth over and over again and never stop. You continue to contend for the faith. You continue to deal with each one according to their several needs. Sounds like flock sheep, doesn't it? We're to be examples as elders to the flock. In other words, because you have certain power, and mind you, I'll say this here, as the Lord was delegated all authority to him by the Father, then the New Testament of Christ Jesus delegates certain authority to the elders. They are called under shepherds who will answer to the chief shepherd in the care of his church. Elders do well to remember this church doesn't belong to us. It just doesn't. So it's to be dealt with like the Lord wants it dealt with, and he placed us in that position as elders to do that. So there are to be examples or patterns of righteous living before everybody, 1 Peter 5 and verse 3. Now some people, as they will with Christians, when they get it in for somebody, then any mistake anybody makes, they're going to try to pull the whole wall down like Samson did. All of these comments relative to Christian living and what is faithful or faithful deacons or faithful elders or faithful preachers, faithful Bible class teachers or any other teacher in the church takes into consideration the human fallible nature. While we all know there's no Christian in the church that's flawless and doesn't need to grow, but you know there's a big difference when you evaluate people to know that they're headed the right direction 
or when they're headed the wrong direction. Brother Woods used to say, when it comes to being covered by the blood of Christ, 1 John 1, 7, as a member of the church, so that has to do with the fact they're all continuing, no matter what, all their life, to head toward heaven as the New Testament teaches the direction to heaven. That's the straight and narrow way of truth. And so it is with every one of us as preachers, as elders, as deacons. That takes into consideration the fact that you can be faithful and need to grow and still do the work with authority that God gave you to do. Elders are to be involved with being concerned about the sick, James 5.14. In fact, part of pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the widows and orphans and their afflictions to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, visit there doesn't mean how do you do. I hadn't seen you in a while. It means that whatever they need, you're going to supply it because they can't supply it for themselves. That's true of widows and orphans. Husband's not there to do what the Bible says the husband is to do. Parents aren't there to do what parents are taught to do in the Bible and take care of their children. And the church is to be mindful of that and take care of it. It's part of living the Christian life. We're to watch in behalf of the souls of the members, Hebrews 13, 17. There are some times, it doesn't have to be a large congregation in number, whereby people could be gone for weeks and members won't know anything. You know why? They'll come through that door and they've got their route. And they go there and if you get older, you end up going back to one of these other rooms. And come back and sit down in the same spot. Or you take a baby out, you go to the same place. We've got trails. If, if our feet with our initials on them were dipped in paint so that we followed the same trail we made by the imprint we made, you'd see that we come into a building and pretty much walk the same way and sit down in the same place all the time. And we don't know who's sitting back over here. I remember one place where I was where the elders told me when I moved there, said, now we've got about three congregations here. And there, in that congregation, there was aisles here, or rather benches here and benches here and benches here. So you had those aisles. They said, one church is over there, and they all go in at that, that door. The, the church here covers right here, and they all go in out this way. And the church over here all goes out. And some will never see one another. Yep, we know a lot about fellowship, don't we? Well, knowing one another may not be all there is to fellowship, but it sure is a good way to start. <laughs> so... When all of these things are done, the elders set the example of caring for the souls and being watched for the souls in all these areas. There are multitudinous things you can plug into these as to what's involved in discharging them. Elders primarily are to choose and have the final say-so in what is expedient for carrying out the obligations that every congregation has. In fact, some brethren, the way they deal with elders, ought to stop and think, well, what's the purpose of them anyway? Why did God set elders in the church? What are they to do if they're just to do what everybody else wants them to do? Why have them in the first place? So when these duties are performed, the church will prosper. But when they're not performed, like the t scriptures say, then the church suffers. As it would in all of these particular matters that identify the church the Lord built. And all of this, it, it must be remembered that the elders, and let me emphasize this, do not, do not have the authority to change God's laws. But Jesus has delegated them the authority to enforce them and to have the final authority in determining what is the most expedient option that that church will use in discharging the congregation's obligation to God. Now somebody says, well, I think everybody will have a part of that. Well, people can give their views, but who's going to have the final authority? Let's bring it down to the home because one of the qualifications of an elder is he must know how to handle his own house, how to manage it, how to run it. Okay, you want to have a vote so that you've got five kids, they've got an equal vote with mom and daddy? Well, you can take their views. You know what children are. You can know your responsibility as father, as the head of the house, but then somebody has to have the final decision. The qualifications of elders are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And Titus 1, verses 5 through 9. Now, the congregation has an obligation to elders. Some people don't know that. The local congregation is to know them. Become well acquainted with them. How are you going to appoint men to be what the Bible says elders are to be if you're not acquainted with them? You don't understand them, and you don't understand what the New Testament teaches regarding their work. By the way, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.13 that the congregation is to esteem them because of the work they do. 
I think some brethren got that wrong. They read esteemed and thought it said steam them. They're to count them worthy of double honor. Well, it would be nice sometimes just to have some honor. But he says double honor those that preach the gospel, 1 Timothy 5, 17. And here's that verse that many have pinned knifed right out of the Bible. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit to them, Hebrews 13, 17. When they're qualified and appointed as elders, they're doing the work of elders, that's the response of the congregation to them. Let me emphasize this point about submit. The idea of submit means, well, they've decided to do something in discharging this obligation every church has, in this particular one where they serve as elders. But I don't really agree with that. Hebrews 13, 17, God said, you'll give account in a lot of this someday, that you're to submit to them. There is no submission if you agree with them in the first place. Submit means mom and daddy's made a decision in the home, now what's the child supposed to do with it? I don't like that. Mommy, Why? Well, a lot of members of the church the same way. But I ask you again, why have elders in the first place? Also, receive not an accusation except by two or three witnesses against the elders. 1 Timothy 5, verse 19. Well, the day that's carried out and done consistently, like the Bible says, there'll be a lot of things stop in the church and begin and work like God wants it to be. It's just as essential for a congregation to perform its duties to the elders as it is for the elders to perform its duties to the congregation. It's not a one-way street. The Bible also plainly teaches that a local congregation should have deacons. I'm not going to go a lot into that and do what I've already said. The qualifications of a deacon are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. They have a work to do. It's different from the elders. The elders have a work to do. It's different from the deacons. Deacons are to be servants. Let me emphasize it again. By the way, there are not many elders. M-I-N-I dash elders. There are not many elders. And do not have the authority of elders. But their work is a great work. And if you're not knowledgeable enough of the Bible concerning their qualifications and their work, then you can't understand what a great work it is. Any authority they may have, that is, the deacons, has been delegated to them by the elders. The elders do not need the deacons' approval for their decisions. Deacons are to help the elders, maybe give them counsel at times if they ask for it, but anybody can be asked something about something. Elders are not all-knowing because they have the authority that God gave to them to do the work of shepherds over the church. They're concerned about the church. How can they watch for people's souls if it doesn't involve keeping people in harmony with the Word of God? So... They're to be uh, encouragers. They're to be carrying out the work assigned to them. They're to know the members well enough so they can pull the members together to get a certain work done the elders have assigned them to do. I say again, deacons must be the elders' right-hand men. A lot of this is brand new to people. They don't know there's that structure in the church. Well, then in that sense, you're not any different than most of the denominational world who don't have any idea that there's a plan of salvation. But the same Bible that teaches the plan of salvation is the same Bible that teaches the organization of the church. And to teach and preach the Word of God is to preach and teach what it has to say about the government of the church as an identifying mark of the church. And that's all very important. Now, much more could be developed on individual things here. And I would say again, if there are questions anybody has beyond this that were raised by this study, write them down and we'll use them in a, in, uh, as a sermon in answering them. As we conclude, just look around about the denominational world today, and you'll not see scriptural organization. You see men doing things the way they want to do them. And in some cases, you'll find that in the church. How does a church cease to be faithful? How do you as an individual Christian cease to be faithful? And, of course, you'll admit you can. You see those churches, seven of them, addressed in the book of Revelation. Notice that they're got on to pretty strongly all except one because they're not what God said a church ought to be. Well, do you think that could only happen back then, even while the New Testament was being written? Certainly not. And you'll remember the church at Ephesus, the elders were commended, the whole church was commended for having uh, tried those that said they were apostles and they were not. That's part of the way the elders guard and keep the church clean. And pure, like God wants it, is taught in the New Testament, is to know the members and know what comes in and who's teaching and how they're living. So, 
I am a member of the Church of Christ as that term is defined and used in your own New Testament because it was founded by the scriptural builder, Jesus Christ. It was founded on the scriptural foundation. It was founded at the scriptural place, Jerusalem. Christ is the founder of only one church, and that's his church, Acts chapter 2. And he adds all those he saves as they obey the gospel to that church and nowhere else. It is scriptural in name, and as we've seen in this study, it is scriptural in organization. It's amazing sometimes how much we can really come down hard on something, certain areas. But on other areas, we just observe the Passover. Because maybe if we pour down as hard on those areas as we do some others that are favorites for us, we might get too close to home with the fact that we're not being all we ought to be and know that we should be. Well, if you're not a Christian, we've studied already this morning how to become one. If you're a child of God that sinned, your obligation is to repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. And thus, at this time, we offer an invitation from the Lord as we stand and sing for you to do just that.